Hello everyone and welcome. This is the second lecture for the threaded shaft project for Machine Tech 210 uh, in which we discuss threads. All the goodness of threads. Actually, this one's not really going to talk about threads themselves, but rather how to make them and how to inspect them. If you're watching this video, then that means that you've gotten at least this far in your threaded shaft project already, right? You've got some diameters turned, you've got some lengths, you've got some grooves and chamfers. You're part of a proud elite that can use a manual lathe, and that's pretty cool, all right? But now it's time to thread the part, right? Everything that we've done, actually, all of these features on this part are really just there to help us thread, right? The things that we have to do to prepare the part for threading. Like these major diameters are the major diameters of the threads. Uh, the grooves are thread relief grooves so that we have somewhere to stop our tool. The chamfers just help us uh, get smooth entry and exit points for the chamfer or for the thread so that they don't get folded over and create basically like a little burr on the ends. Okay, so all of this has been for this culminating moment. All right, let's talk about it. The part looks like this, right? Uh, this is all that we actually get on the, on the print, right? The main print, sheet one of four, right? Where we get this information, 3 quarter 16 UNF 3A and 5 8 11 UNC 2A, that's all that's given to us. It actually doesn't even give us the, uh, the lead chamfers, right? It does give us the grooves, but it doesn't give us the chamfers. And it doesn't tell us anything else about this, these threads except for this specification here, right? But this is a standard specification which means something, right? It refers to a standard uh, for threads, right? And so we can go and reference that standard to figure out exactly what this means, and it relates directly to the geometry and the tolerances for these threads, okay? And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. I'm not going to go through a lot about threads themselves because you should have already watched the screw threads video that I put out there, right? So terms like pitch diameter, major diameter, minor diameter, um, yeah, uh, pitch and number of threads per inch and all that stuff, how to read the actual standard, right? What, what all those, you know, these four basic points, right, in the, in the standard notation, what all those mean, those are things that you should already know, right? And if you don't, you can always reference that video, okay? Um, but one th a couple of things, actually, that the video either doesn't mention or only briefly men mentions are uh, multiple lead threads, different thread forms, and it kind of talks about uh, right-handed, left-handed threads, but I think it's worth just touching on that one more time, okay? So we'll come back to this page, which is sheet four of four, that actually gives you information about um, the thread data itself. We're actually gonna be going through all of this and uh, finding exactly where these numbers come from. Although we do give them to you, but we wanna talk about where, you come, where they come from so that you can go in and figure out this information for other threads instead of just these two, right? So I'm gonna be referencing this PowerPoint Okay, uh, I just printed out these slides because it's a little bit easier to present that way. Um, but this is available on Canvas. Okay, it's got some information, some redundant information um, that kind of follows what we already talked about in the screw threads video. Okay, but it's got some additional stuff in it as well. All right, so the first thing is just that handedness of threads. Remember that a thread is some kind of, it's a wedge of some kind of form, right? Typically, it's like a triangle, right? And you can imagine it as being wrapped around a cylinder very tightly, right? Sort of like wrapping a, a cord or a rope around a cylinder. And the direction that you wrap it, right, can be either clockwise or counterclockwise, okay? So typically, uh, it's, it's wound, right, so that you assemble two components by turning them, let's see, clockwise against one another. So for example, this is a, a standard bolt and nut, kind of large, but still a standard bolt and nut. And so when I turn it clockwise, okay, then they assemble together. And of course I can turn this one clockwise too, they assemble together. But this isn't always true, okay, because there are other threads out there that are left-handed rather than right-handed. For example, these threads right here, 
okay? Um, so these actually, in order to loosen it, I turn it clockwise. And you can see as I turn it clockwise, it comes undone. And then if I turn it counterclockwise, it tightens down, right? So usually the rule is righty tighty, lefty loosey, right? But here it's reversed. Here it's uh, lefty tighty, righty loosey, right? So it totally messes up that little rhyme, but anyway. Um, so why would you use something like this, right? I mean, sometimes you would use it because uh, you're trying to trick somebody, right? So it's like an anti-theft mechanism, a theft deterrent, right? So if somebody's trying to steal something by unbolting it, right? If they don't know about left-handed threads, then as they're trying to loosen it, they're actually going to be tightening it on there even harder, okay? So sometimes that's why it's used. Sometimes it's just to differentiate between two different kinds of um, components, right? So like for, uh, let's see, oxyacetylene uh, gas hoses, right? The fuel gas is always left-handed and the oxygen's always right-handed. Uh, it's also notched. The acetylene, uh, the fuel gas is always notched, right? The, the nut is notched so that you can differentiate it. But they're also made so that you cannot mess them up. You can't assemble a right-handed thread onto a left-handed thread. It just doesn't work, right? And so that's just an extra sort of idiot proofing to something that could be potentially very dangerous. Another reason is to keep uh, threaded components from coming off of a rotating assembly, right? So let's say that this is part of like a pump shaft or something, and this is a little nut that is on there in order to uh, keep the impeller on the pump shaft, right? So just like this is a common component that goes into a pump, and it usually is secured onto the shaft with a, with a nut, and the shaft itself is threaded. Now, depending on the direction of rotation of the shaft, the nut could be either tightened or loosened, right? Uh, and so what you would like is for the direction of rotation to cause the nut to tighten, right? Uh, but the actual direction of the shaft is dependent on other parameters of that machine, right? It's the, the design of the machine dictates which way it's supposed to spin. So you would design the nut that fastens the components on the shaft in such a way that it would tighten rather than loosen with the direction of rotation. So you're, you're going to find, you know, uh, right-handed and left-handed threads out there on shafts all the time. And in fact, you'll even find them on the same shaft, right? So let's say that this, this shaft here, this imaginary shaft, has a big component in the center of it. Well, on this side, in order to secure it, you would need one kind of thread. But if you're going to secure it from the other side, it would have to be an opposite thread. So that as this was rotating, both of them would tighten against the component in the center. Uh, also, bike pedals are a really common example of this. Right, where one side is right-handed, the other side is left-handed, so that as you're pedaling forward, they don't come undone. Now, that makes sense. So I think that's enough about that. The next thing to talk about is multiple start threads, or multiple lead threads. Okay? So it's not about the direction that you wrap the threads, right? it's how many threads you've got. Right? So if you take two thread forms, and then you wrap both of them tightly uh, around the cylinder, then if you look at the cylinder, basically what you'll see is you'll see alternating, uh, alternating threads as those two wrap around the cylinder very tightly. You can imagine it like uh, kind of like a, uh, like a barber's pole. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if they even still have barber's poles out there anymore, but, but that's what they look like, right? They have uh, at least two colors, but usually multiple colors that are interwoven with one another in a helical shape, right? And that's, that's what we're looking at here, okay? So two start threads where you have two threads and they uh, start 180 degrees opposite one another on the shaft. Three start, of course, where you have three threads wrapped together and uh, they start 120 degrees opposite one another on the, on the shaft, okay? And you can have four, five, I've even seen uh, nine. That's possible. So here's an example. This is actually what's called a, a lead screw. So this is where a screw is used not for fastening, but rather for translating rotary motion into linear motion, right? If you spin the lead screw, then it moves the, uh, the little nut here that is 
you know, it's got a flange on it, and so it's fastened to, I don't know, a carriage or something that's riding on some bearings so that this could be moved around. Uh, and then you would put a little, like, encoder on this thing, and then you could get very, very, very repeatable motion, right? Or a stepper motor or something. Okay, if you look at the end of this one, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight threads, right? So this is an eight start thread. Um, and so basically what that, you know, the, the purpose behind this is that you can get very, very, very fast movement, meaning that for a relatively small rotation, you can get a large amount of movement along the length of the cylinder. That's why you would do this, right? Just so that you can get what's called a fast thread, right? Basically, the, the effect is that this is like a very, very coarse pitch. It increases the number of threads per inch, but it doesn't uh, remove more material from the length or from the, the size of the shaft, right? Because coarse threads are physically larger, right? If you have like a 20 TPI thread versus a 10 TPI thread, the 20 TPI thread is physically smaller than the 10 TPI thread, which means that it removes less material from the shaft. So the core, the uh, unthreaded cylinder at the center of the threaded feature is uh, larger, right? So it actually increases the strength of the shaft itself that the threads are on. But what do you do if you want to have a fast thread but you still want to maintain the integrity of the shaft? Well, you could use a smaller thread form but wrap more of them onto the same shaft, if that makes any sense, okay? That's what a multiple start thread is. Let me do a quick little demonstration of how the starts are related to each other. So I don't even know where we got this thing. I mean, it's been here for at least 15 years at the college, um, and probably much, much longer than that. Uh, it's a really, really, really neat little demonstration, and it really gets at the heart of this whole multiple start thread business, okay? So on this same shaft, we have three different threads. The thread forms themselves are all the same. You can see it's the same size, same size threads, I mean, just visually, right? Um, but each one is a different number of starts. So this is a single start, this is a two start, this is a three start. We can also call it single lead, double lead, triple lead. So the point of this demonstration is that as I turn this shaft, you'll see that the nuts that have the little indicators on them are gonna move different lengths, right? And in fact, what you'll see is that this one will move twice as far as this one with the same number of rotations, and this one will move three times as far with the same number of rotations. So if I put a ruler over top of this, the distance between two adjacent threads is the same. Here it's about a quarter inch, there it's about a quarter inch, here it's about a quarter inch, these actually all have the same pitch. But if we go to the beginning of the threads and we look at the starts, over here, there's just that one start. Whereas over here, we've got one and then another one 180 degrees opposite, right? Now I've gone ahead and colored them in red and blue, although it's, uh, it's kind of wiped off a little bit. Over here, we have one, sorry. We've got one, two, three. Okay, so even though the distance between two adjacent threads is the same on all of these, okay, the distance between uh, two peaks of the same thread are going to be either double what this is or triple what this is. Okay, so remember here we had quarter inch. Over here between two of the red ones, we've got a half inch. And then here between two red ones, we've got three quarters of an inch, right? That makes sense. Quarter inch, half inch, three quarters of an inch, okay? Um, and so that's where we're getting this, this uh, cumulative effect on our distance that we travel with each revolution. So let me demonstrate. Watch the indicators. Whoa, that's pretty amazing. Watch the indicators. Whoa. That's 
pretty amazing. I'm continuously fascinated by this little mechanism. But it, you know, we've got it in the shop so you can play with it if you want to. Uh, but this is a really, really neat little demonstration. Anyway, I hope that that makes sense. It should be noted that unless otherwise specified, it's always going to be a one start or single lead thread. Okay? It has to specify if it's uh, a two start, three start, four start, whatever it is. Uh, these types of threads are typically used, uh, you know, in like lead screw applications for power transmission or for like valve actuators in order to open and close valves really fast. The big trade-off here with multiple start threads uh, is that you lose mechanical advantage, okay? You have to really think about uh, screw threads as like inclined planes, right? That are wrapped around a cylinder, but the way that they function physically uh, is the same, right? So the whole reason why you use an inclined plane or a wedge is so that um, like for an inclined plane, you can basically lift something without having to lift it. So you can put in a smaller amount of force to, let's say, push a box up a plane than you would have to in order to lift it outright, just vertically, right? The trade-off is that it's going to take a longer distance, right, for you to lift that thing an equivalent height, okay? So... When you're talking about a wedge, it's the exact opposite, right? Where, let's say you slam on this side of the wedge in order to lift something really big and heavy, the more gradual the taper on the wedge, right, the easier it's going to be to lift that box or whatever big heavy thing it is, right? The more aggressive the slope on the wedge, right, the, the more force it's going to take to lift the, the box, right? The big trade-off is that if you can force that wedge under the box, it's going to take you a shorter distance to lift it uh, an equivalent amount than if you've got a really gradual plane, right? If you've got a really gradual taper on the wedge, okay? So this very gradual taper is like a fine pitch thread. Right? You actually get a huge mechanical advantage, but you have to turn the screw a whole bunch of times to get it to move an equivalent distance into its mating component. Right? Whereas a coarse pitch, you have to turn it fewer times. Right? And that, that same principle applies to our multiple start threads. Right? Because they're basically like, like multiple very coarse threads wrapped up next to each other that have the thread form of a fine pitch thread. Okay? So you lose that mechanical advantage, right? It's like trying to lift something with a really, really, really um, aggressively tapered wedge is what you're trying to do. Okay? So that's just the trade-off. But if all you're looking for is uh, you know, translating rotary motion into linear motion and uh, you've got, you know, you know, you're not limited by the amount of torque that you can put on something, then this is fine. Right? This gives you a really fast thread. I hope that makes sense. The last thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, about threads in general, uh, is the different thread forms, okay? Because that's another thing that the video didn't really go over. So we are already familiar with this uh, unified thread form, right? This is where we've got 60 degrees uh, between the threads, right? So if you kind of connect that all up like that, that's a, an equilateral triangle, right? So if this is 60 degrees, then this has to be 60 degrees, and this has to be 60 degrees, right? And if all of those are 60 degrees, then all of the sides are equivalent lengths, right? So that's an equilateral triangle, equal sides. And uh, this is the by far and away the most common thread form, um, and has been for a really long time. It's very convenient, it makes the math easy, um, it has certain advantages and disadvantages. It's not like the best thread for all circumstances, but it is a really great general purpose all around thread. Um, it's actually not the first standard thread form. The first one was very, very similar, but instead of 60 degrees, it was 55 degrees. 55 degrees. And these were called Whitworth threads, named after... Joseph Whitworth, who was a very, very famous uh, engineer and sort of proto-machinist uh, from back in the 19th century, 
Uh, and he is famous for a whole lot of things, but one of them is definitely his standardization of thread forms and, uh, and pitch series and things like that. So uh, we don't use this anymore, okay, uh, mostly. You can still find them sometimes, like if you ever go out, and I mean, <laughs> if you own a microscope, which you probably don't, um, but microscopes still use Whitworth threads, and some pipe threads still use Whitworth threads. So British tapered pipe threads uh, still use this thread form. Now, this sort of triangular thread form, whatever the degrees are, have some uh, built-in limitations, okay? So a really big one is, I mean, let's just think about this. When you're turning the screw or the nut and trying to make a, a mating component move in a linear direction, right, you're trying to transfer force along this axis, right? But because of the, uh, the angle of the surfaces on the threads, right, the, the sides of the threads, the flanks of the threads as we call them, um, because they're angled, of course, not all of the force goes in this um, axial direction, right? It's actually, if the forces are normal, meaning perpendicular to uh, those surfaces, then some of the force is radial and some of the force is axial, okay? Now, you know, normally that's fine for fastening and things like that, right? But if you're just trying to transfer uh, power, for example, for a lead screw or whatever it is, um, then this is going to just be inefficiency, right? Because not all of the force that you're putting into the system is going in the direction that you want it to go, okay? So that's where this other thread form comes into play. This is called a square thread, and of course if you look at this, right, if this is the mating uh, threads on the other component, right? Now when you're turning the screw, let's say, all of the force is going to be in this direction, right? So this is a much more efficient uh, thread in terms of its uh, uh, in terms of its power transmission, okay? So uh, you'll see this type of thread a lot on older equipment where it's used for power transmission, right? Some older lathes, for example, use this, or older like screw jacks, things like that, right? But we don't really use this anymore because the square threads have a really big built-in problem with them, okay? And that has to do with wear. As the threads wear, like let's say that, um, let's say that they're wearing on, on this flank right here, okay? As they start to wear, right, the gap between the between the threads starts to increase, right? And so you get a whole lot of slop or backlash in the mechanism, right? And as that as that progresses, there's no way to fix it, right? You can't really do anything to reduce that wear, right? To, to reduce that clearance. So at some point, you just have to make new components. There's no other way to fix this, okay? But if you have tapered sides, right? If you have uh, angled flanks, like on the uh, the unified or the Whitworth threads, um, then actually there is a way to compensate. Okay, so let's say that this is our mating thread up here. If there's a way to move the threads closer together radially, right, then we move these diagonal surfaces closer to each other and that reduces the clearance, right? So that's why we really like these, uh, this type of thread form, right? Not only is the math easy, but it's kind of like a, you know, a good general purpose where you can transfer some force, but you can also compensate for wear, okay? Now, another way that you can do this actually is you don't have to move them together radially. If you have, let's say like two nuts like this, and there, ooh, this is a really bad picture. Forgive me. Anyway, so let's say that this in here is the screw and you've got two nuts. If you have some way of controlling the, the distance between them and holding them rigidly, okay, then if you move them further apart, then you can also basically 
move the flanks together on this side, right? So they're closer on that side. And then let's say this is the split right here. And then the other one you move in this direction, right? Now you're moving these sides closer together. Okay, so actually you're also removing the backlash in that way. I realize that this is kind of chicken scratch here. Um, but the idea is that you can, uh, you can adjust for wear by moving the threads further apart axially or closer together radially. And you'll find this type of wear compensation mechanism in a lot of different pieces of equipment. So like the cross slide in the lathe, the way that you adjust for backlash in the, um, the lead screw for the cross slide is with a mechanism like this, all right? But the way that you adjust for the wear in micrometer threads is like this. So if I back the spindle out of the micrometer, Okay, so there you can see the threads on the micrometer spindle, right? So that, that's the screw. And then the nut is here on the sleeve. You can see that in there. And hopefully you can see on the video that that nut is actually split. Okay, it's split. And there's another nut on top of it. And if you turn this nut, it actually collapses the threads on the inside. And that's because the screw threads on the outside for the nut here are actually tapered. So as you turn this down, right, then it actually squeezes the inside. And that's how you can change the, the pitch diameter of the inside threads uh, on the nut, right? And that's how you can adjust for the backlash or the play inside of the micrometer screw threads. Now I think that's pretty neat. The best of both worlds is the Acme thread, okay? And this has really almost entirely supplanted square threads. These threads have, uh, have angled flanks on them, okay? But the included angle is only like 29 degrees. Okay, 29 degrees. Ooh, my handwriting is terrible today. Anyway, 29 degrees included angle between the, the two sides of the thread. Um, so just enough that you can have some kind of wear compensation, all right, but they're almost vertical, so they're actually much more efficient than like 60 degree threads. There's another variation of that called the stub acme, which is the same thread form, but it's not as tall, it's stubbier, just so that you don't remove as much material from the core of the shaft that you put the threads into. Okay, that makes sense. So these are uh, really, truly the modern power transmission thread. You'll find them in a lot of things. All the lead screws uh, in all of the machines use these Acme threads. This is what the Acme threads look like. Okay, hopefully you can see in there those, uh, the slight tapers on the, on the flanks of the threads. Okay, that's what that looks like. Really, really common. In comparison, here are some square threads. Okay, now here you shouldn't see uh, any uh, angle on the flanks of the threads, right? It's just straight up and down vertical. Okay, so that's what that looks like. Put them side by side like that, maybe you can see it a little bit better. There are some other threads as well, like the buttress thread. And the buttress thread is basically like a cross between the unified thread and the square thread. One side of the threads is basically vertical, right? Basically square. I mean, it's not, it's, it's usually like seven degrees, okay? But it's very, very, very close to vertical. And then the other side has an angle on it, right? Like a significant angle, right? In this case, 45 degrees. So you can imagine that the purpose of this type of thread would be to transmit a lot of power, but only in one direction, right? only where it contacts on this side of the threads. And if you rotate it the other way, well, it's not really supposed to transmit any power in that direction at all, okay? So here you have the ability to compensate for wear, but you also have almost as good uh, power transmission capability as you do for the square threads, right? So think about all the things that only need to exert force in a single direction, like a screw press right, or a screw jack, which often have buttress threads on them. Or, and you may not, uh, may not have thought about this, but a lot of plastic containers 
for uh, liquids or um, beverages or, you know, uh, soaps and things like that. I mean, a whole lot of different things, right? So you open this up, let's see if we can get a good shot of that. You see that? That's actually got a buttress thread. And look at the way that it's angled. This container is designed to hold its contents uh, under pressure, right? So it's trying to keep the cap on despite the pressure inside of the container, right? And so that's why the flat side of the buttress thread is on this side, right? Does that make sense? I hope so. Yet another fairly common thread that uh, often goes unnoticed is the knuckle thread. And a knuckle thread is like, uh, you know, not, not really considered a precision thread, okay? It's just these very rounded peaks and valleys. Uh, this is often just molded or stamped or cast directly into a part, so they're typically not like precision machined, okay? So they're really designed to, to just kind of loosely screw something on and be easy to remove, essentially. And we use them all the time in light bulbs. All of these have knuckle threads. You can see it's just a piece of stamped uh, metal, right, in this sort of general form. Not super precision, okay, but it doesn't need to be. So I've actually never seen these really used in anything other than light bulbs, but all the light bulbs use them. Finally, uh, this is not really a different thread form per se, because actually these threads are just 60 degree threads, but what's unique about these are that they're tapered, okay? So I, I don't know, it's, it's a pretty gradual taper, but hopefully you can see that, that on this side, right, the diameter is smaller than on this side, right? So these are pipe threads, okay? And the reason why we would use these on pipe threads um, is because as you turn the two components together, essentially the, the clearance between the threads gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it becomes zero, and you can even wedge them together. And when you wedge them together, then you join them uh, in such a way that, I mean, it doesn't actually provide a liquid tight seal. You still need some kind of intermediary like pipe dope or Teflon tape or whatever it is. Um, but you can actually get a near liquid tight seal that way, right? That's what we use them for. So just thought I would mention that. Had enough threads for one day? Too bad, because we've got more to come. Uh, I'm not going to go over this, but it's good for you to go over it and review this. This is all covered in the screw threads video, okay? We're going to be talking about pitch diameters quite a lot here, right? Remember that the pitch diameter is the diameter on the threads, where the width of the, uh, the threads themselves and the width of the space between them are equal, okay? So just imagine that if I were to measure this over a smaller diameter, like down here, well, this is going to be wider than this little gap. But if I measure at a significantly higher or larger diameter, right, now it's going to be the opposite. That's relatively small, whereas the gap between the threads is relatively large. And so that diameter where they're the same, that's the pitch diameter. And the reason why we care about this is because threads mate on their pitch diameters, right? Because the mating threads touch on their flanks. And when you control the pitch diameters, you can control what that clearance is between the two threads, okay? So this is how we're ensuring fit. Obviously, they need to have some clearance between them, otherwise you won't be able to get them together, but they shouldn't have so much clearance that they're sloppy, okay? So when we're machining threads, we're going to be primarily concerned with achieving the correct pitch diameter. That's the trick, especially because it's not that obvious how to measure the pitch diameter because it's not like a physical, you know, it's not like measuring over an outside diameter where that's just a physical feature on the part. This is essentially like a constructed geometry. It's almost imaginary. You have to use some kind of specialized tooling and do some calculations to get at it. And we'll talk about that in a moment. How do you make threads? 
I split this up into essentially two categories, form cutting and subtractive assembly, right? Starting with subtractive assembly, this is something we're already quite familiar with, right? So in the NIMS bench block project, we tapped some holes, right? So you're already familiar with the basic principle here that if you take a hole and you jam a tap into it, right? It's essentially like a hardened screw. And so as you rotate the, the tap, it'll thread down into the part and simultaneously cut the threads out of the hole that it needs in order to assemble, right? And there is actually an external version of that, the die. So this right here is the, uh, the opposite of this. They're the same size. This is the 5 8 11 tap. This is a 5 8 11 uh, die. And you can see that just like this has flutes, this also has holes in it where chips are allowed to accumulate. It's got cutting edges on it and clearances. And uh, all you would need to do really is take a, a, a shaft and just spin this over the shaft and it'll cut threads into it. Now it's a little bit more difficult than that because it's actually quite... Um, it's quite challenging to get this on straight and to cut concentric threads and to cut them to the correct size. More difficult than tapping something, but it's certainly possible. And there are other types of specialized tooling called like a geometric die head or um, die cutters, specialized machines that are basically uh, semi-automated versions of uh, geometric die heads, which are just these types of dies you know, made to be a little bit more controllable so that you can make really good threads with them, okay? Usually what you would use these for is just chasing a thread, meaning that if there are already threads on a part but they've gotten folded over or something like that and you need to repair them, you can just run a thread chasing die over top of them and it'll cut it right back to its uh, proper shape, okay? Um, but, you know, you can, in a pinch, make threads with this, but it's not going to be nearly as nice as using a form cutting method. Form cutting methods use a single point cutting tool, right, that has the correct form on it, and then the way that they achieve the, uh, the pitch or the number of threads per inch, that helical path, is by feeding that single thread form along that path, okay? So that's what we're going to be doing. Our tool has a 60 degree angle on it, we know that because we went through the trouble of grinding a 60 degree angle on it, right? And as we're making our threads, we're going to be spinning the part and feeding the tool at a very specific feed rate. Actually, it's a feed rate which is equivalent to the pitch of the threads, right? So this is going to be a 3 quarter 16 thread, as we already mentioned. Uh, and so the number of threads per inch is 16. Right? And so that means that the pitch is going to be equal to one inch over the number of threads per inch, otherwise known as a sixteenth of an inch, otherwise known as sixty-two and a half thousandths. Okay? So I'm going to feed this tool at a rate equal to sixty-two and a half thousandths per revolution, and that'll get me sixteen threads per inch. So this is all dependent on the gearing in the quick change gearbox on the lathe. Okay, and so this means that you need two separate sets of uh, controls, basically. You need a control for the thread form, grind it to whatever thread form you want, and you need a way to control the path that the thread form follows, right? And that's dependent on the machine, okay? Now, this little uh, tool right here is called a thread mill. And this is a way to cut threads on a milling machine, but it has to be a computer numerically controlled milling machine, a CNC machine, okay? These little cutting edges right here uh, are 60 degrees, right? So that's the thread form. And the way that you actually control the shape is by doing what's called a helical interpolation, which is where you're not only moving the cutter in a circle, you're also pulling out in the Z direction at the same time. Right? And so that ratio between the turns, right, the circles that you're interpolating, and the distance that you move in Z is what gives you the, uh, the number of threads per, it, per inch or the pitch of the threads. Okay? So that's kind of neat. That's not what we're going to do because that's something you do in the CNC class. We're going to be uh, doing single point cutting on a lathe. 
So the next video, the final demonstration video for the threaded shaft is going to get all up into the nitty gritty of cutting those threads, okay? And we'll do a full demonstration on how to cut both the 3 quarter 16 and the 5 eighths 11 threads. But there's some preparatory work that we have to do right now to figure out what size to cut the threads and how to even measure it. These tables come directly from the machinery's handbook, should be part of your student packet. And this table gives you all of the tolerances for all of the most common threads, the standard threads, okay? Going all the way from an aught 80, which is the smallest uh, thread that is typically used. Actually, they go down to like triple and quadruple aught, so three and four zeros. Um, but those are super, super fine, unbelievably fine uh, little instrumentation threads, okay? So they're not used very often. Um, and it goes all the way up to, let's see, how big does, how big does the chart go? Chart, oh, actually, we only print it out to the one inch, but I think it goes, I don't know, up to like three inches or something like that. So you can find that in the machinery's handbook, or we just put it into the student packet for you, okay? So what what is all this business, this this numbered thread business? Because it goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10, 12, and then it starts off with nominal major diameters, quarter inch, 5 sixteenths of an inch, 3 eighths of an inch. Okay, so, so what's the business with all these? So for whatever reason, um, they use a sort of uh, gauge system, uh, sort of like wires do, uh, when they get below a certain size. So anything below a quarter inch, the standards are going to be given in these uh, gauge sizes. Okay, these all have a nominal major diameter attached to them, and the calculation, just so that you can impress your friends with this bit of knowledge at the next nerdy machining party you go to, is you take the, the number, you multiply it by 13, okay, and then you add 60. And then that's going to give you the, uh, the nominal major diameter of this thread in thousandths of an inch. in thousandths of an inch. Okay, so let's just do this for a number eight. So that's eight times 13 plus 60. Eight times 13 plus 60. 164, which translates to 164. 164 thousandths. Okay, so if you were to take a number eight thread uh, and measure over top of it, this is about what you would get. It would actually be a little bit less than this, right? But it would be close to that. It's based off of that number, right? So, uh, you know, if you do this for a number 10, like a number 10 is a pretty common thread, all right? So uh, then it would be 10 times 13 plus 60, which is uh, 190 thousandths, right? Okay, and so on and so forth, right? Until we hit a quarter inch. But all of these threads are too small for us. We're actually going all the way up to this page where we have our 5 eighths threads and the next page where we have our 3 quarter inch threads. Um, it's always a little bit easier to view this chart, which has a lot of rows and columns in it, um, if you put some kind of a straight edge there to kind of mark your position. So let's just talk about this a little bit. This is our 3 quarter 16 UNF thread, okay? So that's the specification. These are the actual numbers that we care about, right? So this is the, the designation here, the specification. And then we all, can also choose between external and internal. And we're gonna be cut, cutting an external thread, right? That's all of those A's right there, okay? And over here, you'll notice that all of them have B's, right? You'll also notice that there's one, two, three different classes. So it gives you the 1A, the 2A, and the 3A, right? And it also gives you 1B, 2B, 3B, right? So for a 3A uh, screw, a 3B nut would be, made, would be made to fit it, right? And we know that we're gonna be a 3A. So what does allowance mean? What is this number here? Zero. Zero point zero 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 zero. 
Well, allowance is a technical term that means the tightest possible fit, the tightest allowable fit between two mating components. And when we're talking about screw threads, uh, this is talking about the difference between the pitch diameters of the threads, right? And this is the same as saying how much clearance do you have between the flanks of the threads, right? But we're controlling this through the pitch diameter. So a zero allowance means that when the uh, screw is at its maximum allowable pitch diameter, right, the top of the tolerance, and when the nut, the internal thread, is at the lowest end of its tolerance for its, for its pitch diameter, um, they are the same number. And that's actually the definition of a class three thread, is that the two components, when they are at their uh, extremes of their uh, sizes within their limits, they have a zero clearance, a zero allowance, okay? Um, the 2A and the 1A, you can see that they do have some allowance there, right? So no matter how tight you make the fit between the two components, there's always going to be at least this much, at least one and a half thousandths of clearance between them, okay? Uh, class 3 threads are much, much tighter tolerance, right? Their fit is much, much tighter. Right? And so that's where we get this zero allowance from. All right? Moving on to the major diameter, remember that I mentioned that uh, the nominal major diameter, in this case three quarters of an inch, uh, is not the true major diameter, right? Because we have a tolerance here, right? So in this case, the upper limit is 750, which is three quarters of an inch, uh, and the lower is 740 thousandths and six tenths. And lo and behold, that is what we machined our part to when we were doing the, uh, the external diameters, right? 750 all the way down to 740 and 6 tenths, right? And then over here we had uh, 623 and 4 tenths all the way down to 611 and 3 tenths. And as you'll find out in a moment, right, that is in fact the upper and lower limit for the standard major diameter for a 5 8 11 thread, okay? So that's why that happened. Uh, the minor diameter measured at the roots of the thread is given as just a reference value, okay? Uh, and that's because it's really, really difficult to measure down inside of the, the wedges of the threads, right? Down in that inside corner. Uh, and so it, it's not really something that we care about anyway because the threads don't touch at the minor diameters. Actually, these threads are designed so that they are slightly truncated. The threads, and especially the, uh, the inside, the internal threads, are made so that the, the tips of the threads are chopped off, right? So that when they mate up with the uh, screw, there's going to be a, a large amount of gap between the, where, the, where the tips of the internal threads are and where the valleys of the uh, external thread are, right? Just so that you don't run into that issue of having sharp points which contact or where you have sharp points that end up, you know, because they're kind of fragile, they get folded over and then they cause interference issues, okay? So we don't even care about the minor diameter, right? So it's just given as a reference dimension. But this is what we really have to pay attention to, okay? This is the uh, pitch diameter of the thread. And it's given with a lower limit, upper limit, right? 705 thousandths and 6 tenths is the lower, and 709 thousandths and 4 tenths is the upper. Okay? So when we machine our threads, the pitch diameter has to be somewhere inside of those two numbers in order to be considered good. Right? Otherwise, it's no good. It's scrap. I'm not really going to get into the internal threads, uh, because this is going to be the topic of a project in the Machining 220 class, the plug gauge and threaded nuts project. Okay, so we'll save that for then. But let's go ahead and look at the 5 8 11 thread now. So 5 8 11 is right over here on the previous page. And for this specification, it's not a 3A, it's a 2A. So now we're looking at an allowance of 1 thousandths and 6 tenths. Okay, that makes sense because it's a, it's a class 2 fit. Notice that the class 3 fit has that zero allowance on it. Um, 
This is what the major diameter is. Again, that's what we have in the print. We already machined this down uh, in the first stage, right? Uh, and then here's our pitch diameter, okay? 558 thousandths and 9 tenths to 564 thousandths and 4 tenths, right? So as long as our pitch diameter is between those two numbers, it's good. And if it's not inside there, then it's not good. So I understand that this is a lot of information, but I hope that you recognize why we're going through all of this, because it's not just about making this part, right? We're using this part as a way to teach you how to make other parts. So if we just tell you what all the numbers are and we don't even go over those numbers and where they came from, then you will be able to cut a 3 quarter 16 UNF 3A thread and a 5 8 11 UNC 2A thread on this part. But you won't be able to cut other threads on other parts. And so what's the point, right? So that's why we had to go over that. Now, that being said, uh, we do give you all of this information, right? If you look at the thread data, here we've got the major diameter, upper and lower limit for both threads, pitch diameter, upper and lower limit for both threads. We even give you the minor diameter as a reference value in parentheses, and we give you wire size and measurement over wires, which is the next thing that we're going to talk about. Now that we know what size to cut the threads, right? what the, the actual tolerances are, um, now we need to figure out a way to inspect the part to make sure that it's actually within those uh, tolerances, both as a final inspection, but also in process in order to know how much more we have to take off to get to the right number, right? So let's talk about a few different ways to inspect it. The most obvious and most often used method is the fixed gauges method. Right? This is the system of go and no-go gauges that we use for threads uh, in the machine shop. Both internal and external threads can be checked in this way. Okay, so in the NIMS bench block project, you will have used a go no-go gauge for the quarter 20 hole that was in that project, right? And so Remember that one side was supposed to always go and the other side was supposed to never go. Uh, and that's because the go gauge is made to the very bottom of the thread, di uh, thread pitch diameter tolerance, right? So in every case, if the thread was made to the correct size, this should always go, right? But the no-go was made to the very top of the thread pitch diameter tolerance, so it should never go, right? If it goes, then you made your uh, threads too big. The pitch diameter is too big, okay? So that's the basic way that it works. These are just threads that are very, very precisely ground and lapped. They're made out of hardened steel so that they're very wear resistant. So they're just very precise wear resistant threads, but they have the same threads on there as the part you're trying to inspect just at the upper lower pitch diameter limits. That's the big difference, right? Um, now, what we're gonna do now is because we're making external threads, we're gonna be using these um, uh, go-no-go gauges, which are called ring gauges sometimes, okay? So these are called plug gauges, these are called ring gauges. We have them both for the 3 quarter 16 and for the 5 8 11. And you'll see that they come in pairs. There's a go, and a no-go, and they even go one step further and they color code them so that the no-go is red and the go is green, which I think is adorable. And inside here, there are these little screws um, that can actually open and close the entire ring gauge. So you can see that there's uh, two holes here with splits and then another split right here with basically a little screw that can be tightened uh, from here to the other side, so that can open and close uh, the ring gauge, which can adjust the pitch diameter of the gauge itself, right? So these are actually adjustable, but once they're set, then they pour this colored wax in there so that you can't go changing it. And the nice thing about it too is that it doesn't just check for size, it also checks for form, right? If you cut this to the wrong number of threads per inch, right, but it's the correct pitch diameter, well, the go-no-go no -go gauges still won't work, right? In fact, neither of them will go. 
or if you cut this to a thread form other than a 60 degree V thread, it won't go, right? So it checks for a number of things. Um, the big problem with it, actually two big problems, is that uh, you have to buy a different set of gauges for each and every thread that you want to measure, right? Not only each major diameter, but each uh, either coarse or fine pitch series within that major diameter, and for each one of the uh, classes of fit, right? So you have to buy a separate one for a 5.8.11.3a than you would for a 5.8.11.2a, okay? And they're very expensive. So that, that really racks up pretty fast. The other uh, negative about using this method to check the threads is that all it gives you is a pass-fail qualification, which might be very nice in like a high volume production shop where you're just cranking out parts and you just wanna make sure that they're good, right? But if you're turning something on a manual lathe and you need to know how much more material you have to take off, this is not really gonna work. Okay, it, it's really hard to just cut it a little bit by a little bit until the go goes, but the no-go doesn't, right? It's very easy to overshoot that or just waste a lot of time taking un unnecessarily small cuts, okay? So we'd like to have a method that actually gives us a number for what the pitch diameter is. So the first type of direct pitch diameter measuring tool we're gonna talk about is the pitch micrometer. And we actually have a number of these. In fact, I think these are the exact same ones shown in this picture. Um, and these work just exactly like a regular micrometer, all right? Uh, except that the contact points are special, right? And actually, they, they make a lot of these specialty micrometers that work off of, a, you know, the same design for the micrometer screw, but they just have different contact points to accomplish different ends, just like the blade micrometer that we looked at, or like the ball anvil micrometer that we uh, used during the angle plate project, okay? Now, these have... Uh, so the anvil down here has two triangular prisms and the spindle is a cone, both of these 60 degrees, okay? And this is designed so that the cone fits down in between those two wedges right there, the two triangular prisms, okay? Um, and so what you do is just like this, you... Uh, the, the anvil straddles one of the threads, and then the spindle, the cone on the spindle, goes in between two of the threads. Um, and this is going to read, hopefully, directly across, right? It's not going to be, like, cocked out at an angle. It's going to read directly across, but it's going to be contacting on the flanks here, right? Not on the major diameter and not on the minor diameter, right? But actually on the flanks. And so these are directly uh, measuring the pitch diameter. And when you set them, you set them so that the cone is inside of the wedges there. So when you zero set this, you're setting it to like a zero pitch diameter. So let's measure uh, uh, this sample part with this thing. So one thing that you really have to make sure of when you're measuring with these things is that they're actually only good for a specific range. Like, this one is a 10 to 13 TPI pitch micrometer, um, whereas this one is the uh, 14 to 18 TPI pitch micrometer, okay? And the difference between them is that um, this one is good for a coarser series of uh, pitches, and this is good for a finer series of pitches, you can see that the size of the wedges is different and the spacing between them is different, okay? Uh, and so that's the real big reason why these are only good for a specific range is because once those uh, wedges get too big and their spacing gets too big, then they're not going to really straddle uh, that thread in the center anymore, right? And so you, you, you really just have to use the correct ones. Uh, that is, of course, unfortunate because you have to buy a different micrometer for not only every one-inch range, but now you have to buy a separate one for each uh, range of pitches, right? So I can't remember how many come in, like, the, the full set, but it's, like, eight or something like that, right? And it gets real expensive. Um, so that's one downside of these, but they are super convenient. 
the other downside to these is remember that they're designed to operate over a range, but they're not optimized for a specific thread, right? So actually these are not the most accurate way to measure threads, but they're pretty gosh darn close. So the way you use them, right, you, you could easily get it cocked out at an angle like that, uh, and then you're not gonna be measuring the true pitch diameter, right? So you gotta make sure that you're measuring 180 degrees. Okay, and then this is not really the type of tool, I mean, you don't use it like you would a normal micrometer in the sense that you kind of find the diameter and then you run this down until it contacts because you're touching these, uh, on this side, you're touching like a, a conical point, right? On the apex of a diameter. And so you really kind of have to make sure that you're straddling like the largest part of that diameter, the true diameter. So you really have to kind of adjust it and rock it around to make sure that you're where you need to be to get a good measurement. And that's feeling pretty good to me. Okay, just a little bit of drag. And so that says, gosh, 705 thousandths right there, 705. Our tolerance was 705 and 6 tenths up to 709 and 4 tenths. So according to the pitch micrometer, this is actually wrong, right? I mean, it's bad. It doesn't pass inspection. Can we trust the pitch micrometer? Maybe yes, maybe no. Remember that, I mean, it's a little bit of an awkward tool to use because you never know if you're really measuring over the correct diameter. And it's designed for a range of pitches, not for exactly the pitch that we're using. So it's not a perfect measurement. That brings us to the third and best method for direct measurement of pitch diameters. Uh, and that is the over the wires method, okay? In this method, you actually use a regular old micrometer with flat contact points. So the way that you measure the flanks of the threads is by putting some wires in there. And you can see in this diagram that the, the wires, each one of the wires has a three point contact, right? It has a contact on this flank, this flank, and on the, uh, on the anvil in this case, but on the flat contact point on the micrometer. This one also has three points. This one also has three points, okay? Um, and so then what you need to do is you use some trigonometry and you can go from whatever you're measuring over top of the wires, because obviously what you're gonna measure with the micrometer over top of the wires is not what you actually have as a pitch diameter, right? But you can use mathematics to, uh, to calculate what the pitch diameter is based on what the over the wires method is. Now, some of the really nice things about this method is that you can buy these thread wire sets for relatively cheap. I mean, it's like $35, $40 or something for this entire kit inside of the pouch. So this particular set from Brown and Sharp uh, has a tolerance for the diameter of the wires of, I think, uh, plus or minus a tenth of a thousandth of an inch, which is really, really good. Um, it turns out that tolerances on the wires themselves are really important because you've got three wires and they're touching, they're not even just touching like two points like that, they're touching three points. And so variations in the sizes of the wires have a disproportionate effect on the accuracy of the measurement, right? So they, they need to be really, really, really close. Um, and there's a company, Van Curen, um, that actually sort of pioneered and popularized this method of measuring screw threads. And uh, they still sell their thread measuring wires and they're super accurate. They're um, precision ground and then lapped and they're guaranteed within 50 millionths of an inch, which is really close. Uh, these are only plus or minus a tenth of a thousandth of an inch, okay? They also cost $35 for an entire set, and the Van Curens cost like $60 for a single three-wire um, uh, set, right? Meaning, like, you get the three thousandths wires or the three thousandths wires or whatever it is, okay? So, big difference there. The reason there are so many wires 
is that you need a different size for each uh, thread, right? The coarser the pitch of the threads, the, the larger the threads themselves, and so you need bigger wires to get down in there, right? Uh, so this would be for very large threads, and this, uh, you know, the 18 thousandths would be for very small threads, okay? Um, another nice thing about this is that you can actually use these not just for V threads, but also for Acme threads and other types of threads as well, okay? You just have to use a little bit different uh, formula to calculate what the sizes are. Okay, now these things come with these uh, charts. These kits come with these charts, right? For Acme threads, for, yeah, so basically this is a conversion chart for Acme threads. And then you've got this main chart here that shows you conversions for metric threads and all of the calculations for unified 60 degree threads. We're not going to give you this entire set because people just lose stuff, right? And we actually only need two different wire sizes out of here. So instead of giving you the entire set like this in, in the pouch, we've already put the wires that you need into these little canisters, okay? So 40 thousandths wires for the 16 TPI threads, and we've got the, uh, well, this is already rubbed off, but this is 55 thousandths wires for the 11 TPI threads. And so since we don't give you that entire kit, that entire set, you don't get the little chart. So we actually made up a whole another chart for you. This is what we give you in order to do your calculations. It, you can see it's very similar. It's based on the same chart, okay? It's just got a little bit more information on it. Um, so it's important that we discuss how to convert these measurements. So this is where we're going to start. Uh, and the first thing is that we have to select the uh, wire size, and that's based off of, again, the number of threads per inch, so the physical size of the thread form. So we're going to be doing 16 TPI and 11 TPI threads per inch, right? So we're going to be looking at uh, these two rows here and here, okay? So this is telling us for 16 TPI we have 40 thousandths wires, as already mentioned, and for 11 TPI, we're gonna use 55 thousandths wires as already mentioned, okay? Um, the add value here is not something that we're going to really use, okay? Um, but we are going to need to use this constant, the value in the constant column, okay? And there's supposed to be a decimal point right there in front of the zero. The way that we're actually going to use those values is up here where it gives you the formulas that you're gonna use. Um, and then the definitions of all of the uh, variables are up here just on top of that, right? So M is the measurement over wires, E is the pitch diameter, D is the basic uh, major diameter, W is the wire size, et cetera, et cetera. So if, if you have a measurement over wires, M, okay, measurement over wires, it equals the pitch diameter plus the constant. That's why the constant is so important, okay? because that's the number that relates the measurement over wires to the pitch diameter. And so they've already gone and done all the uh, somewhat complex trigonometry, okay, to go from triangles and circles to diameters. Um, so uh, we don't have to do that, right? We just use the constant that they provide, okay? It only works, though, if you use the correct constant for the correct wire size uh, and the correct uh, TPI. So let's go ahead and take a measurement off of the part, right? And then we can convert it using this chart. Okay, we gotta get the, uh, the correct size wires. So this is the 40 thousandths wires for the 3 quarter 16, All right? You can see that we have one of these little, um, it's actually made out of silicone, I think, a little silicone retainer. Uh, this makes it so much easier to use these wires. If you can imagine, uh, if you're trying to hold the micrometer and simultaneously slip these wires in there, okay, it can get really awkward really, really fast, right? So these little uh, retaining holders are very, very useful. And they were also invented locally by Diamond Tool and Die in, I think they're in Oakland. Okay, so there's a little bit of a local history for you as well. So the way that this works 
is that you've got the two wires on the bottom for the bottom of the threads, okay? And then the top wire is loose on top. So that's, you still have to hold that, okay? And this little circle right here is uh, like a conformable fit to the anvil on the micrometer. So you can just place it on there like so, okay? Wow, so convenient. There are all kinds of old school machinist tricks on how to retain these wires without these little uh, holders. And like some of them involve just putting heavy grease <laughs> on the wires and on the uh, micrometer just so you can hold them in place. It's real awkward. These are so much better. Okay, so. Like that. And then the other wire goes over. And you'd really like to make sure that you go 180 degrees opposite, right? So I kind of just follow the thread back to where it goes on the top. That goes in there like so. Okay, and now it's just a matter of measuring over top of the wires and getting a good, accurate measurement. So you gotta rock it back and forth and just get, you know, the, the feel for this is a little bit sloppy, but you can get it. Okay. By the way, these are only uh, designed, they're only manufactured to be uh, guaranteed for their size within the inside one inch. So they're three inches long and the outside one inch sections are not guaranteed for size, only the inside one inch. Okay, so uh, only use the inside one inch for measuring. Okay, what does it say? That looks like 750 plus 20, 21, just shy of 21. So 750 plus 770 and 770 and six, 770 and six. That's what I'm gonna call that. Okay, so let's go back to our chart. So 770 and six tenths is our measurement over wires, M. Okay, uh, and that's going to equal the uh, pitch diameter plus the constant. So it stands to reason that if we've got the measurement over wires and we want to get the pitch diameter, we subtract the constant from both sides. Okay, and we know that the constant is, for this particular uh, wire size in this uh, thread uh, pitch, is 0 0.06587. So 0 0.7706 minus 0 0.06587, 0 0.06587, all right, 704 and 7 tenths. Seven oh four and 7 tenths. And again, our uh, lower limit was 705 and 6 tenths. So yes, we are about a thousandths undersize which is what the pitch micrometer told us, right? So in this case, they agreed very well. Now, to me, instead of having to do this conversion every single time we go in to measure the threads, um, it's a lot more convenient if we just take the upper and lower limits for the pitch diameter and convert them to measurements over wires. So then that way, all we're gonna do is we're gonna be measuring with the wires and then looking for a size that's inside of that range that we calculated, okay? So let's do that. So the lower limit is 7056. The upper limit is 7094, okay? Uh, and in this case, right, uh, we're trying to find uh, M. We're trying to find M, so instead of subtracting the constant, we're gonna add the constant to these numbers. So 0 0.06587 plus 0 0.06587. So 0 0.7056 plus 0 0.06587 gets us 771 and 5 tenths. 771 and 5, okay? And 0 0.7094 plus 0 0.06587 gets us 775 and, well, if we round up, it's three, but we really should round down so that we don't 
uh, accidentally pass a part that is technically not in spec, right? So 775 and 2 is what we'll call it. 775 and 2 and 771 and 5. Now, if you look at the print, of course, there it is. 771 and 5 and 775 and 3. So here we round it up, right? Um, and so we've already given you the, the, the values. But it's important to know where they come from, all right? Uh, these thread measuring wires were one of the first things that I bought as an apprentice machinist. Because when you're making a bunch of threads and you need to measure them, this is by far and away the least expensive way to do it. And it's also, just by chance, the most accurate. Okay, so it's really important to know how to use these. Now, the calculations for the 5811 are the same, right? But you have to use different wire sizes and there's a different constant. Okay, so as long as you know what those two are, you can, right, as long as you know what two of these three variables are, m, e, and constant, then you can always find the third. All right, uh, but again, we've already given it to you here. All right, folks, I think that's it for this uh, second lecture for the Threaded Shaft project, in which we went deep down into the rabbit hole of screw threads. Um, in the next video, next and final video, we'll be doing the demonstration of threading uh, in which I show you how to go from this to this. And that involves lots of setup, lots of fiddling with the machine, and quite a bit of timing and, dare I say, black magic. Uh, but that's the next video. So, see ya!